Um, I started trying to buy organic um, about a year ago and started to think, how is something coming from Chile or Argentina or, you know, how is that good, even if it's organic? So that's when I started to try to look more locally. And what happens when we eat only locally grown food? Well, I think um, just my doing it has made people around me more aware of what they're eating. You know, at my work, um, people were asking me questions. Is a local food diet really possible? We were really poor, and so much of our food supply came from gardening and we it was a huge garden is the local food movement just a niche market or could it actually feed all of us you know we can't predict the future but we can we can create the future a local food movement has begun the seeds have been planted but time is running out Thank you. Have a great day. What will it take to make this movement a local food revolution? It is time to get real about food and the future. I think it was James Kunstler who said, um, thinking of people living on the East Coast, he said the days of the 3,000 miles Caesar salad are, are numbered. We know that uh, eventually uh, we're going to hit one of these, these tipping points and things are going to change dramatically in a not very, not very nice way for, uh, for humans. Today, the world faces a food crisis. Three and a half billion people live on less than $2 a day. They spend 50% or more of their income on food. A billion people worldwide go to bed hungry each night. And if world grain prices double, we're going to see a lot of hungry people in low-income countries that import grain. From July 2010 to January 2011, the price of wheat doubled worldwide. Our current diets are highly dependent on an abundant, cheap supply of fossil fuels. You know, we have built the global system of outsourcing and production based on an assumption of cheap oil forevermore. We built the whole agricultural system that is dependent on cheap oil. The price of oil continues to rise as production plateaus and then begins to fall. This is a phenomenon known as peak oil. Global water shortages threaten a similar crisis, one known as peak water. The rule of thumb um, is that it takes a thousand tons of water to produce one ton of grain. Seventy percent of all the water that we pump from underground or divert from rivers is used for irrigation. What most people have not yet done who recognize that we're facing a future of water shortages is that they have not yet connected the dots to see that a future of water shortages will also be a future of food shortages. The great bulk of the three billion people to be added by mid-century live in countries where water tables are falling and wells are already going dry. The economic and ecological effects of peak oil and peak water are intensified by climate change. As the climatic systems begin to be disrupted, uh, food production is disrupted, we are going to have to recover our capacity to grow our own food and put the priorities on the food that will sustain us in a healthful way. Over the past 30 years, we've, we've, we've arguably destroyed roughly 30% of the regenerative, regenerative capacity of the earth that, that sustains us. So this is not a matter about, of feel-good. This is a matter of survival. We had relatively cheap energy. We had abundant water in many places. Uh, and we had climate stability. And, and we know now that all three of those uh, have been seriously brought into question. I think it's a time of historic shifts. We live in a time of increasing peril, but we have faced profound challenges before. 
Perhaps in their memory, we can find a path forward for us today. President Roosevelt, in his State of the Union address, laid out arms production goals. He said, we're going to produce 45,000 tanks, 60,000 planes, 20,000 artillery and anti-aircraft guns, 6 million tons of shipping. So after his State of the Union address, he called in the leaders of the industry and said, you know, you guys represent a large share of our national industrial capacity, so we're going to depend heavily on you to help us reach these arms production goals. And they said, Mr. President, we're going to do everything we can, but it's going to be a real stretch, producing cars and all these arms, too. He said, you don't understand. We're going to ban the sale of private automobiles in the United States. Overnight, literally, everything changed. In Muskegon, Michigan, the community mobilized. Men and women worked in factories round the clock it was a transformative effort that redefined history. Almost seven decades later, these sacrifices are honored in the communities that made them. The crises we face today may be global in scale. But, as with the events remembered here, our security begins with the community in which we live. What we do here matters. We're in a new era where our well-being, our health, our youth, our security, our seniors, our food, all are going to be elements of our own production rather than our consumption. In this new era, food security increasingly depends on local production, distribution, processing, and storage. A sustainable food system is inherently local in nature. To thrive, we must become native to the place where we live. Each place on Earth is unique. Water, nutrient flows, animal and plant ecology, the diversity and interdependence that makes life resilient is place-based. It is this web of life that sustains humankind. In the words of biologist E. O. Wilson, in a myriad of ways humanity is linked to millions of other species on this planet. What concerns them equally concerns us. The air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we eat, the quality of all of those things uh, influence our health and reflect what, uh, the quality of the environment. So really there is no bright line sort of distinction between where our bodies stop and where the environment begins. We really are involved in a very uh, inter interrelated uh, uh, and, and deeply interconnected uh, set of relationships. All life depends on the soil. Charles E. Kellogg. And take a big handful of soil like this and you know, look under a microscope and say, you know, well, there's a lot of living organisms in there. We now know that in about that amount of soil, in a cup of soil, if it was truly healthy and, and had a lot of food for the organisms, there can be as many living organisms in there as there are people on the planet. What we can actually see with our eye is the pinnacle of, of a huge web of microscopic organisms. And they're fed by carbon compounds coming from the vegetation, coming from the plants that we see. Bacteria are just about the richest source of protein we have on the planet. And the extra nitrogen in that protein has to go somewhere and it gets excreted into the soil um, at a nice, slow, measured rate in a form that plants dearly love to take up. So this community is down there nourishing plants and building soil structure, making it easier for the roots to move through the ground. Agricultural practices at the industrial scale um, are just about the antithesis of 
what's beneficial to these organisms. I think we also need to remember that diversity itself uh, provides resilience to the ecological system. Uh, and so uh, when we, through our activities, begin to diminish that diversity, we also diminish the resilience of the entire system. The more we pour fuel, pesticides, herbicides, fertilizer, and chemicals into farming, the more we knock out the mechanism that made it all work in the first place. David R. Brower. I mean, that is the foundation, is the health of the soil. Um, uh, we really need to be getting back to those basic principles of, of agronomy that, that say that all, you know, that the nutritious quality of the food is going to be uh, very much dependent on the quality of the soil. The things that we need to do to reestablish our agriculture are also about not only restoring our connections to one another, but restoring our human connection to earth. That we have lost our sense of a place of the earth as the nurturing mother that sustains our lives. Paying attention to the details of this is, is really about place. I'm really grateful for the fact that even as a young man who didn't know what he was doing, that we landed on a piece of ground that was fertile enough and forgiving enough that we could stick with it. In the 1880s, it was uh, uh, hard maple, sugar maple, beech, hemlock, climax forest. And that only grows where the ground is good and where there's enough calcium and minerals in the ground to support that kind of growth. And it was one of the first areas of hardwoods that were logged off in the community, mostly so they could get to that good fertile dirt beneath it. There's about 2,000 acres here, and it served as the breadbasket of the community for about 100 years. You know, I've lived in the same house for 38 years, and I can come out the door some mornings, and by the angle of the light and the bird song in the background and the feel of the air, know what I should be doing in terms of, of planting, harvesting, walking, taking a walk and seeing what's going on. All that comes from this sort of sense of place. And, you know, I, I, that's, a, that's a blessing. That's really a blessing. All of the things that we need to do to reestablish our local healthy food systems are also the same things that we need to do to rebuild community. And if there's anything there is a deep hunger for in our country, it is the relationships of caring community. Community is the most important resource of the 21st century. To survive, to thrive, we must become food citizens, not just food consumers. I think as long as you're a consumer, you're not acting as a citizen. A citizen is somebody who has two powers, right? The power to envision the future and the power to gather with other citizens to make that future come true. A community gathers at a football game to honor service. Tonight is senior night, and we would like to introduce our seniors and their Success here depends on engaging everyone, regardless of background. Monoculture works no better in the community than it does in agriculture. The basic resources now to make us effective, functional, and competent are abundant and are among us together, not as individuals, but as families collected together. Residents of Muskegon's Jackson Hill neighborhood gather for the first time to plant an organic community garden. At the center of an abundant community are three things. The first is the recognition of the gifts, the skills, the capacity, the ability, and the interests of all our neighbors. 
And I helped roll up grass and uh, helped police the garden, make sure nobody didn't come in and do what they were supposed to do. And just, I'm Mr. Rotilla. The garden, from seeing it from the from how it first started up until now, and it's just it was just beautiful, especially the sunflowers when they were bloomed and everything. And just seeing how it turned out, you know, never thought it would turn out to be. You know, it started off as grass, and after we got through, you know, we got a nice garden. We came out here, we stood tall, and we did it in the neighborhood where they said it probably wouldn't work or it probably wouldn't happen. It was uh, mm -hmm. it was one of the best one of the best experiences of my life. You know, everybody is imperfect. We're not going to perfect them, but we're going to love their capacity rather than their deficiency. A program at Muskegon's Bunker Middle School matches special education students with student leaders in a school garden program called Seed to Feed. Working in the soil, everyone is equal. Everyone is valued. In the late 80s, the bunker became primarily a middle school. Here we have um, African American, Hispanic, Caucasian, all mixed into one place. We have a wide range of, of economic backgrounds. We worked with a group of peer leaders, eighth graders, that we trained with leadership skills. And then we took those young people into the classroom with the children receiving special ed services. So that meant the cognitively impaired students and the emotionally impaired students. What did I call it? And what else did I call it? They're, they're curious. Um, they'll come out and say, how are our plants doing? I'll say, let's go up to the lab and look. When they dealt with them, they dealt more tenderly with those plants than they probably deal with their younger siblings. When something's cooking, everyone wants to know what's in the pot. And so what you see our students who, um, they didn't beg, but they said, Kurzel, I want to plant too. How do we grow food? How do we give people examples of sustainable landscaping? How do we use these spaces to bring people together? I think young people have the energy and the innovation to be leaders. When it comes to their health and making choices for themselves, I think that needs to be organic. It needs to come from them. Those are the kinds of citizens of which we're in desperate need. People who are advocates for themselves, but through advocating for themselves, advocate for others. The welcome and the invitation within a community and its edge magnifies everybody's sense that they can give. They can give. Every Saturday, this Muskegon congregation serves a free breakfast to over 500 people. The food is purchased with local donations. The labor is volunteer. The people served come from all parts of the community, including some former volunteers affected by the economic hard times. Coming through the program, but the newer ones are ones that within the last year or two were helping us. They were donating into the group, uh, into the funds. They were working with the pantries, and uh, now they're needing some support. You know there are downturns. You know that fuel costs are going up. And you wish there were some policy or governmental change you could make to make things better, but you're not exactly sure what that is. At church-sponsored Gleaner's Trucks, the food crisis has come home. Community food insecurity is on the rise and with it, malnutrition, obesity, and hunger. Over 50,000 people in this county, nearly one-third of the population, receive some form of food assistance. The crisis has been a long time coming. You know, we've been in a quality of life recession ever since 1975, even though GDP has more than, has more than doubled uh, since then. And I think that's the shift in worldview and thinking that we really need to, to implement at this point. We need to start thinking much more about quality <clears throat> and well-being rather than simply quantity of production. What we see in renewables and what we see in local food production, what we see in, um, in uh, ecologically intelligent activities is that all sustainability, like politics, is local. It can only be measured at the local condition because you have to be standing somewhere and say, am I in a sustaining environment? Am I in a sustaining situation?
All sustainability is local. The transition begins with rebuilding the local food economy. Like life in the soil, a sustainable local food system is built on diverse networks of food producers and consumers, all acting as food citizens. The benefit to human and economic health is substantial. The whole system could be modified in ways that would be health providing, would be good for local economies, and would be uh, very useful in reducing the chronic disease burden. We welcome you, and this is our festival for everybody to be a part of. We can do anything when we do it together, right? The resources for this transformation exist, even in the poorest communities. Last year, Muskegon County residents received over $80 million in food stamps, now called SNAP benefits. Virtually none of this money was spent with local farmers to purchase healthy local food. If just half of SNAP benefits were spent on locally grown food, they could produce an estimated $200 million in new economic activity without increasing public expenditures a penny. Since 2006, the Sweetwater Local Foods Market has offered organic, locally grown food, including fresh fruits and vegetables, and grass-fed, humanely raised meat and dairy products to food stamp recipients. I think we can also look back and see how we profoundly influenced human health by what we did. Uh, we, we have uh, taken the, 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 the plant diversity out of our diets, we have brought into our diets processed foods. Uh, we brought into our diets uh, meat that is being raised uh, in an industrial uh, factory model, um, and it's reflected in our health. In Traverse City, Michigan, the local Catholic school system transformed its school's meals by purchasing food locally and preparing it fresh daily. In 2007, we set up a system called the Life Balance Initiative, which is a wellness policy to incorporate from scratch cooking and locally sustainable foods. What we do here is we take food in its purest form, minus the preservatives, food dyes, and we cook, we roast, we mince, we saute, we dice, and we julienne every day. We do as much as we can from scratch. Right now we have 40 gallons of chicken stock simmering back there, and what we'll do is we'll turn that into chicken noodle soup, which kids love. We'll turn it into chicken uh, tetrazzini. We buy local bread from a place called Bay Bread. We all know local organic products are going to be better nutrients for our kids. But what we're charged to do at schools is help kids grow in knowledge. And you can't do that when you're chuck full of everything that's processed. And so logic behind the dollars and cents of it is we're in a private school, but our kids qualify for free and reduced lunch just like any other school in the country. Our lunch prices are very reasonable and comparable. And so, uh, so we're, we're, we have figured out what it's going to take for us to break even. Over the time, though, uh, we've noticed that the kids crave good local foods. They're eating quinoa, uh, bulgur wheat, ratatouille. Most of the time, we're preparing meals for kids that any of their parents uh, would be thrilled to eat for lunch from a flavor factor and from a health factor. What this says to any parent coming in here is, the school cares about my child in their entirety, and they care about my child the way I want them cared for. The people who are going to push uh, superintendents to act are school boards who get together and say, hey, this is right, what we're doing is wrong. Let's just do, this is an easy one. I think there's a dearth of, uh, of creative spirit in uh, a lot of the present activities. But where we see that creative spirit, we realize that that's the one inexhaustible resource, is human creativity. The Benton Harbor Fruit Market is the largest cash-to-grower wholesale fruit and vegetable market in the world. 
five and three. <laughs> Located in Benton Harbor in southwest Michigan, the market provides hundreds of small farmers with a place to sell fresh picked local fruits and vegetables. It is at the heart of the local food revolution in this place. We know that there is a, a virtual revolution occurring in community-based food systems. But what we haven't focused on um, is how do we transform this incredible interest for three or four months out of the year uh, to an interest that provides accessibility to local foods year-round. The Mendel Center at Lake Michigan College serves over 15,000 meals annually for conferences and special events. In 2009, the center began to purchase and preserve fruits and vegetables from Benton Harbor fruit market farmers in a move to provide healthy local food year-round to its customers. When we initially started, um, Lee had actually come to us with the idea of not just buying locally, but starting to, to preserve our products to use all year. So how do you take broccoli, and instead of preserving for 30 pounds for your family for the winter, how do you do 300 pounds? The final crop of the 2010 season was cauliflower. Um, we were preserving and putting up uh, local cauliflower um, for the winter, and so we, we uh, have a process where we um, cut it and get it ready to boil for a couple of minutes, blanch it, and then we shock it in ice water. And then we put it on pans to, to drain a lot of the liquid out, and, or the water out, and then we put it in bags and preserve it for the winter. Actually, after looking at the money, we spent um, a surprising number less with our general distributor in the past year. Um, and with that, we took that money's now been spent locally, and we've also saved a lot of money. We love it. We, I, it's, it's the next best thing from, from being fresh. I mean, we, we, the things that we do get in, if we have to buy it from a large purveyor, does not even begin to compare in flavor and texture, appearance. And we get a lot of really good comments back from our guests. So we love it. I think the principal significance of the Mendel Center and Lake Michigan College uh, in, and their commitment to a community-based food system is that it opens the door for others to realize that if they can do it, we can do it. If we are in a moment of crisis, we are also in a moment of growing opportunity. The local food movement can become a revolution if we are intentional in our efforts and design. It is a challenge we cannot afford to ignore. For as Wendell Berry reminds us, nature is party to all our deals and decisions, and she has more votes, a longer memory, and a sterner sense of justice than we do. It is time to build an abundant community and a thriving future around healthy local food. I think the crisis that we have is a crisis of the imagination. Um, we focus so much on the noisiness of ordinary life without uh, allowing us to imagine a perfectly exquisite future. That change in our patterns, uh, you know, changing to that completely different track, is not something that's going to lead to massive sacrifice on the part of of uh, the human population. I think, in fact, the reverse is true. Not making that change is what's going to lead to massive sacrifice. Your children's life and satisfaction will grow out of what they produce, not what they consume. And we are recovering the productive capacities of local people to shape and produce the future. The new story is we're all in this together and we got to work together for solutions that are going to work for everybody. Because if they don't work for everybody, ultimately they're not going to work for anyone. It is so basic and so obvious. If our children, our families, our communities, and our natural environment are healthy, then we're prosperous. <laughs>